right, a very good morning everybody from wherever you're watching us this very chilly morning. Finally, the rains are here with us and of course we cannot be more than appreciative of the same. This is your world, yes, you are not lost, the show is your world. My name is Vili Luba and of course today we are not in the studio but we are on location. And of course, as you there saw there when we started the show, we are at the Aga Khan University Hospital. Now, it is not the main, uh, you know, center that you know, and this is as far as Aga Khan University Hospital is concerned, but it is on, uh, we are here in Roisambu, and just to be exact, all right, what to show you is the Roisambu Specialty, um, you know, care center, and of course, there's so much happening here. I know when we're standing from outside, it looks like a very small facility, but there is a lot that is happening here, and of course, we'll be talking about about, um, you know, what exactly or what solutions Agatan is bringing. And this is as far as access to quality healthcare is concerned. Because majority of the times, uh, when we talk about access to healthcare, it is very vital for people to have quality healthcare services. But according to statistics, nearly half a billion, um, you know, people do not have access to essential services. So why is this the case? Well, how about we come in and get to understand what exactly is happening right here at the Agatan, uh, you know, University Hospital. And like we said, we are at the very simple specialty uh, care center. What solutions do they bring? Because like we said, majority of the times access to healthcare sometimes might be a bit of an issue. So this is the, you know, main reception <laughs> when you come in. And of course we have some of the seats here where people can wait from. But we are here to understand. So when we talk about access to quality healthcare, right? What exactly does that look like? What is it that you're looking for when we talk about quality healthcare services? And what exactly is Aga Khan um, you know, providing? So to help us with that and much more, we are joined uh, you know, by a very essential person who will tell us all about that. And of course, I am talking about Mr. Kuram Jamal, who is the Chief Operating Officer, Outreach Network East Africa. And this is as far as Aga Khan University Hospital is concerned. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you, and thank you for having us on your show this morning. No problem. Beautiful facility. Thank you. <laughs> if I could say, but let's just start with first things first. You know, when it comes to access to healthcare, most of the time, we as people, we have like a very bad seeking health behavior. When it hurts, is when we go to the hospital, right? But as far as Aga Khan, uh, you know, is concerned and what you have noticed around, what would you say, you know, is the main issue as far as access to healthcare services? So, uh, great question. Access, as you rightly point out, uh, is one of the main issues, uh, at least here in this part of the world. Uh, in East Africa and in Kenya, we're trying to address one of that issues uh, by creating access. Access is, of course, one of the main core principles and values of Al Khan University Hospital in Nairobi, mm -hmm. in addition to impact, uh, quality, and relevance. So. This is bringing services closer to the patients. Uh, we now have in excess of 50 plus medical centers spread across East Africa, in Kenya and Uganda. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is us trying to do our job by creating access yeah. for the communities we want to serve. Absolutely. And majority of the times when we also talk about access, sometimes quality might be a bit compromised, right? Because as long as there's a health facility nearby, that is all that matters. So, and most of the time when we think about Aga Khan, we just think about the main hospital. But like you said, more than 50, um, you know, centers spread across the country. So when it comes to then quality, what exactly does quality look like for Aga Khan? Right, so uh, many of uh, you know that uh, our hospital in Parklands is a Joint Commission International Accredited Institution. Just last year in July, we were re-accredited for the fourth time. Mm -hmm. Our hospital is also accredited with the College of American Pathologists. It's also accredited with uh, SANAS, and this is specifically for our laboratories. So the same standards apply in all the medical centers that we have, right? So we have picked... Uh, on all the different standards of Joint Commission in all, our, our, all of our facilities. Um, and quality is really important. And at the same time, uh, let me just mention that uh, even the physicians that we have practicing in all our facilities have gone through all their required trainings and they bring the same quality of care to the patients in the outreach medical centers. They are well supported by our uh, other caregivers in the form of nurses and laboratory technicians and pharmacy technicians. In fact, when we recruit these uh, caregivers for outreach, anytime we're opening a new facility, they are required to undergo a rigorous training in the hospital 
understanding the systems and policies and procedures and best practices before they're actually sent out to our uh, medical centers. Uh, and this year, as outreach, we're also taking on our journey to uh, get our centers in Nairobi accredited with safe care. Uh -huh. So uh, that's, that, that's our commitment to our patients, that whenever they visit any of our facilities, mm -hmm. the standard of care that they will be given in outreach will be the same as the standard of care that they would expect Absolutely. in the main hospital. Absolutely. And of course, it's very, very important. Um, and like we said, over 50 um, you know, centers spread across the country. The biggest question is, what exactly is the mot motivation behind that? I know we talked about access, yes. which is very, very important. But yes. aside from making sure that people have access to quality health care, what else is the motivation behind that? So we are a not-for-profit profit organization so okay. we're not in it for the profits mm -hmm. okay as I mentioned uh, our core principles includes access mm -hmm. impact quality and relevance mm -hmm. so uh, many a times what we do is we reach out to our uh, staff that work within the medical centers All right. We ask them for what services that they would like us to introduce. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we do a patient satisfaction surveys mm -hmm. in which one of the questions is uh, seeking opinion from the patients to find out what services they would want us to introduce and where they would like us to go. Oh. Uh, that is also very important. In fact, uh, our valued partners in uh, insurance companies, mm -hmm. we have regular engagements with them as well. So uh, many a times they would tell us that this is an underserved uh, community, underserved county in Kenya where quality healthcare is lacking. So we would listen to them and uh, we would explore our options and at the same time, if we feel fit, then we would obviously go, go to those locations and set up a facility. Similar to the one that we set up late last year in Wajir, mm -hmm. which is in the northeastern part of Kenya. So, right. so that is the motivation mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we approach mm -hmm expansion of the outreach health network. Absolutely. And there's something interesting that is the neighborhood clinics, right. which I think is very, it's a very interesting um, you know, concept to think about. Um, so when we talk about this particular facility right here in Rissambu, right? Um, what exactly happens here? Because like I said, looking from outside, you might think, okay, yeah, this is just maybe one of the offices because <laughs> one of the centers and then you get in and you get surprised um, you know, about how big um, you know, this facility is. So what exactly happens here? What are some of the services that are being offered? So yes, so I'll mm -hmm. get to that. So bringing specialty services closer to the patients is, is really one Important. of the key uh, yeah. things over here. And we have this facility in, in Roy Sambu on the ground floor and upstairs we have a second facility as well. Mm -hmm. Between the two centers, uh, we provide, specifically for this one, we have medical oncology where we will provide chemotherapy services. Oh, wow. We have a minor daycare OR where mm -hmm. we will be taking care of day surgeries. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have a gastroenterology uh, unit, so an, an, an endoscopy suite is there as well. Mm -hmm. Upstairs we have a dialysis mm -hmm. uh, facility, we mm -hmm. have various specialty clinics, mm -hmm. we also provide ultrasound, we have a fully equipped laboratory along with the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So many nice things. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the reason for it really is that uh, many of the patients sometimes do struggle to visit our main campus in mm -hmm. Parklands. So this is us trying to bring specialty services closer to the patients. Yeah, and I like the fact that you don't really have to travel miles and miles and miles for you to access. Um, because majority of the times, and even for the, some of the cancer patients, getting access to where they can get their chemotherapy, you know, on a daily basis without having to travel so far, sometimes it's usually a challenge. So having it here is really, um, you know, interesting. I know we'll visit, um, you know, the, yes. the, the <laughs> uh, you know, the different, uh, you know, again, like we said, subspecialists just to see what exactly is happening happening and all those things. Um, so how are people responding so far, um, if I can say? So um, <clears throat> this we opened the doors uh, roughly three weeks back. Okay. Um, it has been a good start for us. Uh, our nurse in charge over here tells me that we have uh, four to five patients booked today for uh, minor day K cases. Mm -hmm. Um, we've already started on the chemotherapy sessions for some of our patients mm -hmm. and we're also starting with our uh, gastroscopies fairly soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're fully equipped uh, and it, it has been a good start for us. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed for us to be taking care of more patients okay. fairly soon. All right. And of course, when it comes to then offering solutions to to majority of the people, because like you said, go around looking at some of the needs of the people and making sure that, you know, we offer that. So, so far as Aga Khan University Hospital, how much of a solution would you say you have offered so far? I think we've done quite well. Okay. Um, you know, 
when I look at uh, the different types of services that we're offering to our patients across the board, mm -hmm. from primary care to secondary care, mm -hmm. and now moving rapidly into specialty care, mm -hmm. uh, most of our facilities, in fact, more than 50% of our facilities in outreach mm -hmm. now offer diagnostic imaging, mm -hmm. right? So we have x-ray services, mm -hmm. we have ultrasound services. All our facilities have fully equipped labs, uh, well-stocked pharmacies. Uh, we provide a whole host of specialist care. Mm -hmm. So many of our faculty from the main hospital, including obstetrics and gynecology, mm -hmm. pediatrics, family medicine, mm -hmm. internists, oncologists, mm -hmm. name it. They, yeah. they, they visit our facilities mm -hmm. uh, simply because we want to mm -hmm. provide that specialty care to our patients. Absolutely. Now let's talk about one of the biggest things that a lot of people have, you know, a bit of a challenge and that is as far as cost sure. um, is concerned. A lot of people would pay out of pocket, um, you know, expense. Some would also, you know, rely on covers here and there. Um, but generally cost is usually a very big issue in the country. Cost of, um, you know, access to healthcare and treatment as well. So what exactly is Agakan doing to address that particular concern? Right. Mm -hmm. So, I'd be lying if I said that I'm creating access without providing affordable care to patients, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. so uh, the cost structures, at least in outreach, mm -hmm. is significantly lower than the main hospital. Okay. Um, what we've done is we have engaged uh, extensively with our insurance companies and, uh, and other partners mm -hmm. and the patients through the patient satisfaction surveys mm -hmm. to find out uh, what is the sweet spot of the price point mm -hmm. where people would like to come and visit our facility. So right. at least in this uh, Roy Sambu Specialty Care Center, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to mention that across the board, whether it's chemotherapy or endoscopy or daycare surgeries, the prices are 30 to 40 percent lower than the main hospital. Oh, wow. okay? okay, so that is our commitment to creating access mm -hmm. to the patients. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, we have recently reduced our consultation fee mm -hmm for many of our centers in Mount Kenya and the Rift Valley region, mm -hmm. uh, where we would normally charge 2,200 shillings for a GP consultation. Oh. That price has been brought down to 700 shillings. Oh, wow. Okay. Similarly, uh, it, across the entire network, uh, when you would want to come and see a specialist, mm -hmm. instead of paying 4,700 shillings in the main hospital, you'll end up paying 3,700 shillings in outreach. Wow. So, as I said, mm -hmm. we are able to provide the same quality care to patients in outreach mm -hmm. at a lower price simply because our cost structures in outreach are significantly lower mm -hmm. than the main hospital. Okay. Um, I'm just going to put you on the spot, all right? Over 50, <laughs> you know, centers spread across the country. My, my next question is, what next? Uh, do we expect to see 100? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, fingers crossed, yes, we will get there. But, yes. but uh, if I look at between Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi mm -hmm. and our sister institutions, mm -hmm. uh, Aga Khan Health Services yeah. in Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, and Kisumu, we have a network of over 100 medical centers. Oh, wow. Um, but in Aga Khan University, we have 50 plus. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the expansion and the growth agenda still stands. Mm -hmm. uh, we still want to create access. There are still communities and counties that are underserved, mm -hmm. uh, that, that who don't have access to quality care. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are eyeing areas in Mount Kenya, such mm -hmm. as Mwea or mm -hmm. Muranga or Karatina, mm -hmm. even Sagana. All right. uh, in the northeastern part, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in our conversations with the insurance companies, they have requested us to mm -hmm. see if there is possibility for us to introduce new medical centers in Garissa or Isiolo. Mm -hmm. so, so those are all areas where, where we want to go and visit, where mm -hmm. we have... Uh, opportunity for us to provide quality care to patients right. um, and we're also starting off with our home health services fairly soon so oh. uh, instead of patients wanting to come to visit a healthcare facility mm -hmm. we can now now send our caregivers to the patient's home at mm -hmm. the comfort of their homes mm -hmm. and provide them with the care that they need. Convenience. Yes. Convenience is very, very key. Yes. I like that. All right. So speaking generally to our health-seeking behavior, like we said, sometimes we're not doing very well, you know, until it hurts is when we visit, um, you know, the hospital. And again, like we can uh, all attest the fact that um, curative, you know, approach is very, you know, expensive to a lot of people. So then moving to more of a prevention aspect, what would you say? Talk to the people uh, in terms of just, first of all, understanding some of these common illnesses, conditions that we're dealing with, and what we need to do about this. Right. Uh, so great question. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, made a deliberate effort mm -hmm. within the main hospital mm -hmm. and in our outreach medical centers mm -hmm. to create awareness for our patients about right. wellness. Okay. Right. Uh, 
because wellness is if, if you're well then you don't necessarily have to come to that's the healthcare true. facility that's so true. Mm -hmm. so early signs and symptoms are important mm -hmm. if there are red flags then you can raise them fairly early mm -hmm. enough for them to for patients to know that you know this is something that they need to pay attention to mm -hmm. so um, we have wellness programs and packages spread across all our facilities all whether right. it's in the main hospital mm -hmm. or uh, our very renowned outreach facility on Peponi Road, mm -hmm. uh, which is known for providing wellness packages. Mm -hmm. uh, we're setting up a brand new facility in Karen, okay. uh, and, and that will be completed uh, in a couple of weeks' time, right. uh, where, we'll, where we will offer uh, wellness packages. Mm -hmm. In fact, across our network, mm -hmm. whether any of our medical facilities is in Mount Kenya or the Rift Valley region or the Northeastern region mm -hmm. or whether in Nairobi. Okay. We have those wellness programs okay. in place that patients can take advantage of. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that is what's most important for us. Mm -hmm. Rather than coming for curative care, as you rightly point True. out, yeah. if there are early signs and we can detect them and we can take care of them and address them, mm -hmm. then, you know, it makes it easier. Absolutely. All right. So as we finish here, because again, like you said, a lot is happening here <laughs> that we might be able to see if we just stand here. So we need to see them. So what would you say as you're parting short in terms of, you know, the future as far as, um, you know, health care is concerned, not only in the country, but also across the globe, even as we move to the oncology center. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, um, what we're trying to do is uh, healthcare is, is 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 a field, is an industry that is moving mm -hmm. fairly fast, mm -hmm. right? Um, the days of setting up massive facilities with 500 beds mm -hmm. are no longer mm -hmm. in a requirement, yeah. according to me. Okay. I think what what the world is moving towards, mm -hmm. and and the pandemic has taught us this, mm -hmm. that telemedicine is very important. When mm -hmm. I say telemedicine, it includes teleradiology, it includes mm -hmm. uh, teleconsultations. Mm -hmm. It includes uh, collection of samples from patients of lab from their homes, delivering medications to their homes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are very important factors, including the home health services, as I just, you know, briefly mentioned. So that is where, according to me, healthcare is moving towards, mm -hmm. and that is what we're trying to do as well mm -hmm. at, at the Al Khan University Hospital. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time, really. Uh, you know, to help us take us through what exactly happens, what, uh, you know, uh, you know, seeking access and especially when it comes to healthcare services looks like and of course here uh, we know in Roy Sambo specialty care center right okay yes. so of course we need to move uh, you right. know and take a look at what is happening you know on the oncology unit yes. uh, you know that we have in here all right and of course we're going to meet um, Dr. Amina and of course she'll take us through what exactly happens um, I visited the room um, and all I can say is you actually need to you know you need to actually see it um, you know for yourself so um, you know we're gonna go here all right and of course uh, at the chemo this is the chemo suite right and of course Dr. Amina um, you know, is waiting for us to just take us through what exactly happens here, what are some of the services that are being offered, and, uh, you know, what you can expect. Because, like we said, it is time that we have a lot of people actually getting access to healthcare services from wherever they are, okay? And, of course, Dr. Amina is here. It's so good to see you. Um, you know, this morning, how are you doing? You can see, you know, this is sort of like your office, <laughs> I can oh. say, uh, you know, for now in this very few minutes, um, but just take us through what exactly is, um, you know, happening here. Okay, so good morning. Mm -hmm. um, this is not my office. Okay. Just this for now. <laughs> <laughs> this is our chemotherapy unit. Chemotherapy suite, yeah. Uh, this is the where our patients come to receive their planned treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one to three chemo sits mm -hmm. and one bed. Mm -hmm. um, some of the patients come here for some very long treatments mm -hmm. that can even last the whole day. Mm -hmm. So they'd be using that bed. Mm -hmm. um, we have our spill area. If any spills of the chemicals happen to any of our staff or the patients, mm -hmm. they can do the washing there. Okay. And um, yeah, this is essentially where we give our treatments in this unit. Absolutely. Yeah. Now let's talk about just cancer overview in the country, right? And of course, like we all know, cancer is one of the leading causes of death. Yeah. I mean, right here in the country. How bad is the situation? What exactly is happening? Um, so, yes, so first of all, yes, the, there's been an increase in cancer cases, mm -hmm. um, but um, I'd say it's about third cause of, can of deaths mm -hmm. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So number one would be cardiovascular diseases, those are heart diseases, mm -hmm. um, two is infectious diseases, unfortunately, and three, we have cancer. All right. So I'd say it's pretty high up there, mm -hmm. yeah, as it okay. is, yeah. Okay, um, and when, it, when we talk about access, um, you know, to 
you know, health, and especially as far yeah. as cancer treatment um, mm. is concerned. Again, a lot of people would say it is very pricey, right? Yes. Um, so that when it comes to understanding, first of all, the disease in itself, because there's a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, we'll be told, um, sometimes we don't know, um, you know, what causes the cancer. Sometimes we actually know. So when it comes to us as people and understanding the disease and knowing what we can do uh, in order to prevent the same, what would you say? So most cases of cancer, we actually wouldn't know what causes the disease. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some of the most common reasons that we might know and actually are able to do something about mm -hmm. would be um, lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. That would include uh, obesity, inactivity, um, alcohol intake or rather increased alcohol intake, mm -hmm. um, smoking, um, uh, sometimes things that you can't prevent would be the family genetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see, you, you might find a family, you know, two, three people are affected with the more or less some the same mm -hmm. family of cancers mm -hmm. so those are just some of the reasons we'd say one person would be affected by a cancer mm -hmm. yeah but most of the time i'd say um no one can really pinpoint the reason why a cancer is happening mm -hmm. and you're right about the cost yeah so looking at the challenges of cancer one would definitely be the cost of accessible treatment All right. the other would be the expertise mm -hmm. for you know to diagnose the disease and treat the disease as well um, accessibility you know the centers are very few mm -hmm. most of them are really concentrated in the big in the big cities mm -hmm. so um, and we know majority of the population is actually in the rural areas All right. so accessibility is also a challenge mm -hmm. so as Aga Khan I think this is us trying to um, bring the service to the people mm -hmm. make it accessible f for the majority of Kenyans at least Nairobians yeah um, yeah and, and majority of the times we've seen in different parts of the country where people have to travel mile and miles yeah. and miles, um, you know, to seek um, services and of course, for example, chemotherapy um, being one of them. So yeah. having such an outreach here, yeah. um, you know, in the people, what would you say to what magnitude it helps uh, in terms of making sure that people have access to the same? Okay, so you know we're just starting out, yeah. but we really hope to reach out to a lot of Kenyans who require this service. Mm -hmm. So for me particularly, what is relevant is oncology service yeah. and what we can offer here. Mm -hmm. And what we can't offer here, the patients of course can access at the main hospital, but at least there's a direct link with us to the main hospital. All right. Um, we hope to target, of course, th this is a very concentrated area, mm -hmm. but also central Kenya, mm -hmm. which of course is quite accessible with the thicker road. Yeah. Um, I, I think for this center, this unit, um, that's what we could capture for now. But of course, we, we are hoping to open up even more centers for mm -hmm. subspecialty services. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So we're here at the chemo, um, unit, you know, yeah. chemo unit, right? Yeah. Uh, and I can see there's chairs. I was about to call them beds, but we have a bed yeah, yeah. <laughs> over there. So, yeah. Do you want to just take us through what usually happens, um, you know, when someone comes for their chemo yeah. session? Because they, you know, different services. We have the yeah. chemo, we have the radiotherapy, we have surgeries in other instances. Yeah. But when one comes for chemo, what exactly happens? Um, you know, when one comes and sits on this chair. Okay, so before you even come here, mm -hmm. uh, we normally have a consultation. So mm -hmm. within this unit, we have um, our clinics, mm -hmm. which we run, myself and my colleague, who's a hematologist as well. Mm -hmm. We run the clinics, consult with the patients, and discuss treatment options. There are many different options in cancer patients for mm -hmm. very different indications. All right. um, one of them is, of course, chemotherapy, which is offered here. Mm -hmm. But um, for radiotherapy, surgeries, so for surgeries, we do some minor surgeries here, mm -hmm. but majority of the big surgeries, cancer surgeries are going to be happening at the main hospitals, at least for now. Okay. Um, so for chemotherapy, it's actually, we, we like to say it's never an emergency. Mm -hmm. It's a planned treatment. Okay. So by the time a patient is coming here and meeting one of our qualified nurses, um, we've actually been discussing the treatments and what to expect. And um, they come at a particular day. It's again planned because we also want, you see, it's a bit limited, mm -hmm. the spacing and the beds. Yes. Um, so they come on a particular day. Uh, they get their treatment. Mm -hmm. Of course, before the treatment, they can get some some fluids, some medication to counteract the, some of the side effects of the chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. um, and most cases that say about six hours is enough for someone to get their treatment and actually go home and mm -hmm. complete their treatment and go home. Okay. Um, it's a day unit. Mm -hmm. Most chemotherapy is actually day units. Very mm -hmm. rarely you'd want to put a patient in the ward for, mm. for treatment. Yeah. That's true. That's mm. true. All right. Um, but for someone who has never, you know, 
heard about chemotherapy or don't know yeah. what usually happens because yeah. I can see there's a I don't know that calling like a tiny machine or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> equipment and then of course there's that stand and then there's yeah. a chair right yeah. so I wanted us just to move there very quickly so that you can tell us what exactly happens um, you know okay. so over here and uh, yeah so this is, of course, the serving table. Our patient is seated here. Okay. Uh, this is the drip stand. Mm -hmm. This is an infusion set. Mm -hmm. So most of the chemotherapies uh, that are delivered are going to be um, infusion, so IV via a vein. Mm -hmm. And so the bags of the drugs are going to be up here. Right. And they're mostly monitored mm -hmm. because you want them to go in at a certain rate. You don't want them to go too fast or too slow. Okay. All these things have implications to the disease and to the patient. Mm -hmm. So um, this is used to monitor the rate of how fast or slow we want the drug to go mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially our dear nurse here <laughs> is going to be <laughs> is going to be making sure uh, so our instructions are followed because we have to write that down. True. And uh, it's inputted into this machine mm -hmm. and the patient receives their treatment. Mm -hmm. It's very comfortable really. Yes, I can see the seat here. Of course there's a headrest um, you know yes. over there so that they're comfortable um, as well. But even beyond the seat, um, yeah. the treatment itself, most cases, it's really comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. um, patients come, they watch TV. Yeah. They watch TV. They can be doing their own thing. Some come with their laptops and they're working. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time you don't smell anything. Mm -hmm. You don't hear anything. You don't feel anything different. Ah, interesting. You're uh -huh. able to have your meals. Some come having their breakfast. Some have them here. We provide uh, snacks as well during the treatments. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, and, you know, they just go through their treatments. Mm -hmm. We go through our protocol of what needs to be done. All right. And the patients live. Okay. Yeah. So how long, um, you know, is the patient, or the, yeah. how long does the treatment take? Yeah. It really depends on the regimen that we are giving. There are okay. different treatment plans depending on what we are targeting, disease mm -hmm. site. It's very different for everyone, every individual. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say on average... A patient would be in this unit for six hours. Okay. Am I right, Faith? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So about six hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Preparation, um, and again, delivering yeah. the treatment and everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and, and just after the treatment, very quickly before we go on a break, um, what are some of the things that, you know, patients need to do or need to know? Because I can imagine, I mean, you know, going on, you know, the treatment for six hours and then after that, you know, um, you know, the whole process going home, what is it that they need to do or mm. to know? And even for the caregivers, as well mm -hmm. that's a very good question mm -hmm. why because our patients are always asking what do i eat what do i avoid yes do i take milk mm -hmm. do i take meat mm -hmm. and um honestly there's really no prescribed diet with chemotherapy mm -hmm. um or with cancer okay. diagnosis most of the or most of the time we're just going to say you know stick to a very balanced diet and i can say most kenyans really do have a normal balanced diet yeah. you know you have your carbs you have your vegetables you have your fruits um, and the protein as well there's nothing that is exclusively you should not eat this or you should eat this because it's going to make the disease or the treatment work better mm -hmm. yeah okay but again it's also very individualized mm -hmm. many people come with different scenarios that you know presenting that to us we are able to advise better like you know maybe you should be away from this or that. Okay. Yeah. And even now before treatment, right? Yeah. Um, patients may be supposed to eat, not to eat. Because mm. majority of it, I suppose, will be told, um, you know, before you go, um, for example, for a certain procedure, mm. maybe do not eat for like three hours before you come in and also yes. for chemotherapy session. What happens No, before? no, no. For chemotherapy session, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I, I want to put a disclaimer and say, you know, it's very different for it's different, different patients, for different but generally yeah. mm -hmm. we don't say don't eat or don't eat this particular food or, you know, when we think about cancer and its treatment, mm -hmm. I'd say diet and meals, especially during treatments would really come a bit low on our priority list on what we need to be careful about. Okay. There, there are many more other things that we are concerned about. Mm -hmm. One is infections, which we try to counteract. The other thing is the side effects of the chemotherapies, mm -hmm. which we also trying to support the patient with. So there are many other issues other than food because we know, you know, in a average Kenyan family, they're really just going to be having a balanced diet. That's true. Yeah. That's true. All right. Um, and before we go on a break, because we need to go on a break like right now, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, as we bring this to a close. Again, like I said, treatment varies from person to person, yeah. right? Um, you know, and even on the staging and all those things. Yeah. But generally right mm -hmm. how many sessions would you say one might need generally okay mm -hmm. that's a hard Tricky, one yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so 
let me take a ki two cases. Okay. One would be most common cancer, breast cancer, mm -hmm. a patient who has had surgery and they are coming now for either s before surgery or after surgery and they're just coming for chemotherapy as prescribed. Okay. They'd likely get six to eight cycles of treatment. Okay. Um, the other scenario would be uh, someone with a stage four breast cancer. Um, the treatment at that point is not really prescribed to number of cycles. Mm -hmm. It's just prescribed to how well we are controlling the disease okay. and how well the patient is tolerating the side effects mm -hmm. of the chemotherapy. All right. Yeah. Okay. So there's no magic number that this is where yeah. we are going to start. After five okay. sessions, you're done. No, Absolutely no, no, not. No. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell I mean, the people so that we bring this to a close because we have two other units to, <laughs> to visit. What would you tell people as far as just first of all, understanding cancer mm -hmm. um, you know, in itself and also the prevention aspect of the same? Um, so, you know, it's fortunate that um, most of the common cancers that we have statistically, both in Kenya and globally, they're cancers that can be diagnosed quite early. Okay. And uh, the, the thing with cancer is once diagnosed early, you treat it early and you move on with life. So um, these are colon cancer, breast cancers, and they're picked and they're screening tests that can be done. Um, we have them, many, many centers in Kenya also have them. We are trying to create awareness about this. And so my, my take home point would just be um, to involve ourselves with uh, information or get information about these screening services All because, right. you know, if we say one in eight women is going to get breast cancer and if we are able to get six women with early breast cancer, potentially cure them, We've actually won that battle. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Amina, for your time today and taking us Thank through you. what exactly happens here, and especially when one comes for their chemo session. That has been Dr. Amina Habib, who is a consultant oncologist right here at Aga Khan University Hospital. All right, so we're going to go on a break, but when we come back, like I said, we have two more units to visit, and of course, we'll be visiting a gastroenterologist, and of course, we're also visiting uh, a general surgeon as well, right here in this facility, and that is Roy Sambo Specialty, uh, Specialty Care Center. So all that is coming up after the break. Stay with us. This is your world. Whatever question you have as far as access to treatment and of course access to quality health care is concerned, feel free to also drop them on our social media handles at NTV Kenya, both on Facebook and on Twitter. And of course, we'll try and answer them before we uh, you know, complete the show. But for now, let's take a break. See you shortly. <music> Choose boldness. Celebrate the skin you're in and dress with confidence with Nivea Nourishing Cocoa Body Lotion. The triple layered care of deep moisture serum, precious cocoa butter, and vitamin E enriches your skin for 48 hours. Choose to wear your skin with pride with Nivea. Own your dream home for as low as 1.98 million Kenya shillings in Vipingo Kilifi and enjoy a flexible payment plan of 10% on signing of the letter of offer and the balance in equal monthly installments within 18 months. Supported by world-class amenities and infrastructure, our estates offer a unique, secure environment with a wide range of outdoor facilities. SMS Vipingo to 22365 or call us today on 0740-400-215. Terms and conditions apply. This People is say most spice. Sing a new key. Back when we listened to our radio. This is your number one station for more music. Nation FM. What on the ground on Mambo Vitu Mazi? Unajua my MC one gap you are reggae music. Ama who's your favorite reggae MC Mazi? Find out, Tisa, where are you going? Yeah. What are you going to do? Ah, I'm going to MC Jawatch. Yes. Eh, Manzee. Where are you going? Ah, no. MC Jushman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's good to know your MCs. No, na zanzi na sisi pale boko radio. Alafu tungi wapi? Yes, kwa pili mazee kwa zia. 10 p.m. Up until mazee maibayake. Au siyo. Hashtag ni ile moja tu. Jam down KE. Kaboom. Send me the pillow that you dream on. Don't you know that I feel good for you. Let me stare in. No, I'm not going 
the lace, the mystery. No ba unga ti browse on flick, the mystery. No unga me gonna next week, the mystery. Only on the trend at 10 p.m. The trend in association with Showmax. Karibu sana. Are you ready? I'm here for the tea, honey. You bebelete. Watu wana simanga ni mkalia. Eh na nyuko ile ni mkalia na matako zangu mbili. Sawa? Ufinita punda punda ni wewe. This is the greatest show. An all-stars affair. One goal. One stage. The London Marathon, 23rd April, live on NTV. Want to know the biggest story of the week? Do not worry. The Weekly Review has got you covered for in-depth analysis of politics, business, governance, as well as social issues. The Weekly Review covers it all. For well-researched, exclusive and investigative content, read The Weekly Review every Sunday on Nation Ipepa and on www.nation.africa, free of charge. Get Salazangu by Ilagosa wa Ilagosa. Dial star 812 star 832 hash. Skiza na nation. Bladder control issues can be embarrassing for so many people. As a woman gets older, mm -hmm. and especially maybe postmenopausal, mm -hmm. then uh, for some of them, there might have been some latent uh, injury during delivery. Mm -hmm which then manifests itself a bit later, later. Uh, in their life. Especially when I'm sneezing, the doctor said, mm -hmm. or when I'm walking for about 15 to 20 minutes, by the time I finish the walk of 15 minutes, mm -hmm. I've already written myself. Your sister, because maybe you're in a public, you might start even smelling. You know your urine, urine smells. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This week, we have a special trend. I will recount my interactions with some of the women who have made my journey around Kenya fun and possible. <laughs> we will see how women have contributed to making travel fun and exciting. From conservation, fishing, Power production, farming, marine vessels, even the production of this show, to so much more. Alrighty, welcome back. And of course, as you can see right there on your screen, clearly written, clean area, restricted. All right. And then there's me <laughs> right here. Of course, before we go I mean, to the um, theater, like I said, because we have two more units to go through, I cannot cross here with my hair out in the open. All right. So I have to have a proper gear for the same because remember, hashtag, we need to maintain hygiene and also make sure, you know, everything is clean, clean. All right. So um, I need to have my hair net. I already have, um, you know, 
<laughs> my shoe cover, uh, you know, on. So before we go in, we have Lillian. Lillian is like, you cannot, you cannot enter. All right. So Lillian is just going to fix me <laughs> so that I am ready um, to go. But the show is your world. And of course, today we're talking about, um, you know, access as far as quality healthcare is concerned for some of the solutions. And like I said, we are here at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Raisambo Specialty Care Center to be, you know, exact, especially where we are um, today. And of course, we're just trying to understand, first of all, why is it important to have as many, um, you know, outreaches as possible? What solutions are they bringing, um, you know, to the people? Because like we said, when it comes to access to healthcare, majority of the times you'd find that people would have to travel miles and miles and miles, um, you know, just to access healthcare. But now you have, you know, that option of having, you know, healthcare facility near you, but also providing quality. I, am I okay to go? Okay, all right. I need to ask <laughs> Lillian for the same. So here we are. Um, we have two more units to go um, through. And of course, like I said, we're going to go to the theater in just a moment because there are some surgeries that are performed here. So which kind? We'll be looking at that very shortly. But before that, we have the pre-operating room over here. So what exactly I mean, happens here? Well, we have Dr. Brian Misoy, who's a general surgeon, to help us um, with the same. It's so good to have you and to see you this morning. Thank you, Thank you very much, first of all, for allowing us to come <laughs> into your space. So take us through what exactly happens here um, you know, at the pre-operating room. Room. Okay, thank you again for having us. Okay. So this is a preoperative area, mm -hmm. and this area is where our patients come in uh, before going into the OR. Okay. So we would have seen them in the clinic before, mm -hmm. had a consultation, made the diagnosis, mm -hmm. but once we do the consent, they've approved uh, to have the surgery. Mm -hmm. They would come to the preoperative area mm -hmm. where we would do our marking mm -hmm. um, as per the safe surgical checklist. Mm -hmm. um, we would also uh, identify any uh, allergies. We would also uh, talk to the patient and see if they have any concerns mm -hmm. before that, okay. before going into the operative room. Okay. Here is also where we do the minimal preparation, like putting in IV lines uh -huh. and uh, just checking the, the last vital signs before going in. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. All right. And of course, it's just basic everything, you know, happening clean yes. <laughs> has to be clean, yes. right? So across that line. Yes. Now sterile. Okay. Yeah. All right. So after everything, you know, is prepared and the patient is ready to go, it's yes. where we transition yes. to this so other we side. So we walk to the theater okay. side. All right. So if you can just show It's this. very convenient. It's really, you know, close by. Yeah, which is, definitely. Which is very okay. All right. So let's... So this is okay. the scrub area mm -hmm. uh, where the surgeons wash and the, wo and the scrub team wash and come into the operative area okay all right so i'm just gonna go in for you okay who ah, it's a little bit cold yeah? Yes. yeah the <laughs> ventilation we like to keep it that way yeah uh, so that we limit the uh, infection uh, of mm -hmm. surgical sites okay. Yeah. okay all right so take us through what are some of those um, you know services that offered here in terms of like the surgeries because there's the day surgeries right what exactly first of all does, does that mean so day surgery means uh procedures that can be done um as a, as a walk-in, so the patient comes in, uh, they get the surgery done, and they don't have to spend the night in the hospital, okay. uh, so they can go home the same day. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yes. All right. Um, and then, of course, the night is where you have to be admitted, you know, and all those things. Yes. It's cold. Okay. Yes, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's all yeah. right. So, what is this? What is happening? Right here. Then okay. So, happening. just to take you through the suit. Okay. Uh, so, here we have our... Uh, trolleys where we mount our sets. Okay. Uh, this, the trolleys are usually sterile mm -hmm. and we're going to put our sets here, our operating equipment, mm -hmm. and then um, we put our sterile equipment as well on this when it's over draped here. over. Okay. And then when you go to that side, uh, you're going to see what is an electrosurgical unit. Ah. So the electrosurgical unit is what we uh, use to do our operations, especially when we anticipate some bit of blood loss. So we can use some energy uh, devices to help with vessel sealing. And then we have our oxygen tank, which is just a standard um, uh, size. We have this machine here, which is a tourniquet. Um, we use it for several reasons. One is to limit blood loss in extremity surgery. That's the limbs, upper and lower. And then we can also use it to administer different uh, anesthetics, what is called regional anesthetic. Okay. Then we have a standard monitor, uh, which you can do... Um, electrocardiac uh, monitoring, mm -hmm. uh, monitor your su oxygen saturations, right. your blood pressure, and uh, this is the standard of, um, uh, monitoring uh, during the day-to-day uh, -day procedures that we do here. Okay. And then we have our drug cut, uh, which also at the bottom has our basic life support equipment. So here is where we put our um, uh, medicines that we'd use to administer the local anesthetic 
together with uh, any other additional medications that we need and together with a sharp box. Um, on the side here, you can just show that, we have a suction uh, machine, ah, okay. which is a standard size. And then this is our operating seat. Sometimes we do surgeries seated. Seated. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a, a standard operating table, operating table, which is hybrid, can uh, be used for many cases. Okay. Yeah. So we've talked about the day and, um, you know, night or overnight surgeries, right? But we also have like minor and major surgeries. So yes. can we just do a bit of a to trend shule <laughs> okay. and get to understand really the difference between the two and which ones you offer here? Okay, so if you look at um, different definitions, uh, you'll find different answers. But basically, minor surgery is surgery that involves minimal risk. Um, patient has a shorter recovery time. And generally, you would not uh, cause too much, uh, say, anatomical and physiologic insult. So that means the patient will recover quite rapidly. Yes, so that's the difference between, that's minor surgery. Major surgery now would be the, uh, the opposite of that, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so like I said, day surgeries mostly happen here, right? And yes. And then if something major, uh, we don't, one will have to visit the main yes. hospital, right? Yes. So for the minor surgeries, what, which ones do you or have you performed so far in this unit? So in this unit, um, initially we aim to do um, local anesthetic cases and uh, light sedation cases. Mm -hmm. So those are some of uh, uh, the cases that we'll be doing. And if you look into... Um, the list, we have excisions of small masses uh, superficially, and then we're going to do maybe things like uh, circumcisions. Um, we'll also be able to do uh, things like releasing of tongue ties for pediatric cases, and we may be able to do some minor orthopedic cases and minor hand surgeries uh, in this operating theater at okay. the moment. Mm -hmm. All right. So as we finish, because we literally have uh, 30 seconds <laughs> in yeah. this room, what is it that you will tell people about understanding surgeries and the procedure, um, you know, and what to expect, and especially when it comes to like a case of a day surgery? Very quickly. Okay. So day surgery is the way to go. Uh, it's cost effective. Uh, patients recover better when they're at home and they're exposed less to hospital acquired infections. Uh, that is where the world is going. So at Aga Khan, we're also striving to offer that. And um, ah. in this facility, we're going to be able to scale upwards. But in the meantime, the list of surgeries is what we've offered. And they're offering it in a safe and uh, uh, high quality way. Same as we would have offered in the main hospital. Absolutely. Yeah. Bringing services to the people. I like that. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Brian Misoi, General Surgeon, taking us through what exactly happens right here. It's chilly, so I'm just going <laughs> to... All right? And of course, like we said, we're not only visiting, you know, the theater, but we also have another unit that we all should be aware of. And of course, we are talking about the endoscopy suite. But majority of the times, uh, we're not able to differentiate between... This, it's warmer here, which is a good thing. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we're not able to differentiate uh, between between colonoscopy and, um, you know, endoscopy. And, of course, uh, we need to really understand what exactly happens between the two, okay? Of course, to help us uh, take us through that process, we also have Dr. Christopher Opio, who's a consultant, gastroenterologist, um, to take us through what exactly happens here. It's so good to see you this morning. Just Thank you so much for allowing us to come here. <laughs> so, first of all, can we just get to understand colonoscopy, endoscopy, big words? So, um Basically, endoscopy is a tube that passes through a cavity in the body. Mm -hmm. So um, when you talk about endoscopy, it means you can have um, cavities through the mouth, cavities through the um, rectum, okay? Um, you have cavities through the ear or nose. So basically, and of course, laparoscopy is also a kind of endoscopy because you go into a cavity. Okay. So... Technically, we are supposed to have, if it is passing through the mouth, mm -hmm. to the gullet, mm -hmm. to the stomach, and to the duodenum, it is called um, esophageal gastro duodenoscopy. In other words, it's just translating. I'm passing through the esophagus, stomach, and mm -hmm. duodenum, okay. which is the first part of the small intestines. Yeah. Now, the, the other names that people use, for example, gastroscopy to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. So endoscopy is a misnomer in the sense, mm -hmm. okay? So, but colonoscopy means it passes through the colon. Okay. And sigmoidoscopy means it passes through the mm -hmm. sigmoid colon. And rectoscopy means it passes through the rectum. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Big words, but uh, things that we know. So <laughs> just remember, yes. where's the tube passing? Okay. Yes. So okay. if it is passing through the mouth, and where is it going through? Okay. That is the name that of the, the 
the tube okay. procedure. All right. Yeah. So very quickly, what are some of the conditions that might, um, you know, require one to go through an endoscopy? So um, strictly we are digestive disease specialists. So we look at the digestive system. All right. So um, sometimes, most times when you have digestive diseases, mm -hmm. it starts in the inner lining of the digestive organ, right. especially if you're dealing with luminal problems. For example, the esophagus, mm -hmm. um, the stomach, and the duodenum. Mm -hmm. well, of course, there are other digestive organs for those who use other modalities, for example, imaging, biopsy, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But for the esophagus, stomach, and, uh, and the duodenum, basically you have um, some common diseases. So mm -hmm. we have the so-called uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which um, is basically acid refluxing, okay? Mm -hmm. Because between the stomach and the esophagus, there's a sphincter, mm -hmm. which opens, I would say, once in a while right. to let food through, mm -hmm. but closes off okay. because acid is produced in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So the best test to look at that lining mm -hmm. is not imaging per se, okay? Okay. Yeah, imaging is just a shadow. Mm -hmm. Okay, of course, imaging has improved. The best test is to look directly. It's like if you have a wound in your mouth. Okay. What would I do? Would I take an X-ray? No. <laughs> no. No, not, no, not necessarily. Yeah. I'll look directly into your mouth and see what is happening. Exactly. And most of the... Um, so you talked about diseases. So you may have inflammation of the esophagus. I've talked about gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay. which is very common. Um, if your immunity is suboptimal, I would say you can have infections of the lining of the esophagus. And of not, you can also have cancers, precancerous and cancer. Cancer of the esophagus is very common here in Kenya and in the region. Mm -hmm. So it is important for us if we suspect mm -hmm. that you have um, cancer of the esophagus okay. to look in. And it's also used for screening. The same problems occur in the stomach. In the stomach, you have infections like Helicobacter pylori, which is an organism that is in our environment. You may have heard of it. Everybody's crying about it. It is estimated up to half of the population have been exposed to it or have it. Okay. Okay? So most patients present with epigastric pain, epigastric discomfort. It has other complications. For example, you may have uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. You may develop ulcers. You may have iron deficiency. Okay. And later on with a small proportion, you can also have um, cancer. Mm -hmm. So it is important for us to screen. Then there are other diseases. For example, um, if you take drugs, you may have erosion of your stomach. Yes, yes so those are important. For example, uh, many people take drugs for, for, for pain management and etc. Um, I've talked about cancers. Um, the uh, other conditions of the stomach that are also important. Uh, I don't think I need to go into that. No, no, yes, because yeah. it's uh, becoming more complicated. I know, yeah. okay. And, and we have very limited time, but we just need to understand. So what exactly is this? What happens here? Very quickly before we end the show, because we need people to really, really understand. So um, we have agreed mm -hmm. that gastroscopy is important. It's yes, important. yes, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. So yes. Um, it is important in diagnosis, but it can also be used in treatment. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. For example, if you're bleeding, we can stop the bleeding with a tube mm -hmm. and manipulate. Okay. Uh -huh. um, we, if we want to make a diagnosis, we can take a biopsy, mm -hmm. all right, which yes. is small scrapings or pinch or something of the sort. Okay. Um, if you have a blockage somewhere, we can open that blockage mm -hmm. and keep it patent with, with, but we, we, we work with the tube. Okay. So basically, um, this, uh, uh, what we're offering here is just uh, um, uh, um, uh, gastroscopy or endoscopy services for the upper half of the... Of the body. Yes, of okay. the body. Right. And um, what we do, we have a thin tube, okay? Mm -hmm. That tube can be used in children up to about five years and so forth, mm -hmm. but here we'll be dealing with only adults for, okay. the, for, the, for the time being, okay? Basically, uh, this the system has you can see it has. I can see you. Yes, you, you can see me. You you, you can see me. Yes. So basically, it has a camera, yes. a thin tube, uh -huh. and most people say the tube is big. Yeah. No, but we say when you eat sausage, how big is the sausage? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you yes okay. yes right. you, you eat it and swallow it. So the tube is not necessarily big. Okay. okay. And the tube is is it is 
this system is approved yeah. okay, and it has been in use for so many years. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. So we have a tube, a flexible tube, black right. tube. Okay. And usually what we do, we just spray the mouth with a local anesthetic. You have two options, one with sleep, one without sleep. Okay. So there are those who decide I don't want sleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talk to them, we just pass the tube. Usually, usually a procedure takes about um, five to ten minutes. All okay. Right. It's not painful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it's painful, there's something going wrong already. Okay. So, but uh, the, why most people have, some people have anxiety. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're coming for a new procedure, yeah. obviously, or if you're going for an interview, yeah. all right, like now, yeah. you may be tense mm -hmm. and so yes. forth, etc. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what happens. So most people hold their breath. Otherwise, um, we pass the tip down. All right. Look at the, the surface of the, the, the esophagus, mm -hmm. surface of the stomach, mm -hmm. and then we come out. Okay. okay? So right. the tube is connected to a system that, uh, a video system, okay? Mm -hmm. So we are able to keep pictures, mm -hmm. all right? Uh -huh. And we are also able to um, archive the pictures mm -hmm. and do other things with it. Okay. Yeah, so all that right. is it. So when we are doing this procedure, um, the major objective is safety, 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 safety. So we have monitors around, we have nurses around just yes. to see how you're doing. Yeah. If you have it with sleep, we, we um, definitely will have to monitor you after. Absolutely. Okay. And all the healthcare workers here are trained in, in an extra way. Absolutely. All right, yes. So of a quality, yes. um, you know, which is yes. very essential. It yes. doesn't, you don't have really to be in the main hospital. For yes. yes. You can actually access the services here. Actually, you'll okay. get, be getting the same services same, same and services. same quality. Yeah. yeah as as in the here. Main okay. Absolutely. All right. So as we bring this to a close, because we literally have to end the show right now. Yes. So can we talk about, um, you know, prevention of you know, some of this common, you know, things that we deal with. For example, we have cases of, you know, ulcers, gastritis, bloating, and all those things. What are the things that we can do? So the, the, the question is, you, that is why we have this. Yes. We need to know what are what we exactly treating. exactly is happening. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Then you need to treat the cause, mm -hmm. okay? Because um, most people will come presenting with upper abdominal discomfort, bloating, mm -hmm. and so forth, etc. Right. There are many causes. Mm -hmm. If I wrote them down, yeah. it is from here to there. Yeah. So the doctor needs to tease through uh, what are the main causes. And remember, the causes vary by age. True. The older you are, the more likely you are to have certain diseases. For example, if... I'm obese, mm -hmm. I'm more likely to have reflux, okay? okay. All right? All right. Um, uh, uh, if I'm from this region, I'm more likely to have H. pylori, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And there are certain things we do before we, 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 we kind of subject you to, to the test. So okay. um, prevention depends on the cause. the cause. So digestive causes are very many. Sure. But what we fear most are the cancers, all right? So if, for example, H. pylori is a cancer-causing agent, so if we think that is going to be, we need to eradicate it. As okay. Soon as possible. Yes. yes. Um, uh, hygiene is important. Mm -hmm. Then there's the issue of feeding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So feeding is and nutrition is very important. Okay. If your nutrition is good early on in life and throughout your life, yeah. you're less likely to, to get, get obesity and you're less likely to get reflux. If you're smoking, you're more likely to get reflux. You're more likely to get cancer of the stomach, cancer right. of the esophagus. Mm -hmm. So that is where we are. Okay. Then there is the environment. For example, we have uh, what we call functional dyspepsia. Mm -hmm. The doctors looked for everything and found nothing. Okay. Uh, maybe they may find a little bit of um, abnormal movements in your bowel, but you still complain of you're not sleeping, mm -hmm. you're fatigued. So that functional dyspepsia may be related to um, stresses, environment in life. Okay. So um, don't be surprised if yeah. we get patients who are depressed, who mm -hmm. come for, for, for care, um, we offer care by the digestive disease specialist. Okay. So, so there's a lot. There's a lot. Yes. All right. Okay. So we'll so talk until good. the cows come right? home. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. That, have to say. Thank you very much, Dr. Christopher, Opie, a consultant, gastroenterologist. Uh, you know, for all of allowing us, um, you know, into his space so that we can get to understand what exactly happens here. But the point is, there is a possibility for you to actually have access, uh, you know, to quality uh, services from wherever you are. And of course, we were here today at the Aga Khan University Hospital, and of course, to be exact, right here at the Roy Sambo Specialty Care Center. So we have to say a very big thank you to the entire team for allowing us to come here today so that you can clearly see that there is a possibility that you have a healthcare center near you that offers quality I mean, services at the same time. So my name is Winnie Lubembe. Have yourselves a lovely day ahead. I hope you've learned a lot from today's conversation. And also remember, version is very, very key. So I'm going to get out of here so that I allow Dr. Christopher <laughs> and his team to get back to work. But for now, goodbye. We are leaving.
see you <laughs> next week on Monday. All right. Goodbye for now.